So yesterday, what we um, where we covered at the end of the class was we talked about the evidence we have for evolution. So remember, when we say evolution, we're talking about species changing over time. That species have been modified through the process of evolution. And there have been changes to some species from uh, what they have been in the past. And the next thing that we need to start to talk about is, so OK, species change over time. How does that actually happen? How can a species, a group, a population, like change its features, its characteristics? How does that happen? And so it happens through this process we call natural selection. And natural selection was um, sort of what Charles Darwin proposed as his explanation for how species change over time. So we can imagine just a very simple example. So let's say we had a species of mice that lived in a certain area. And there was some variation in their fur color. Some mice might happen to be darker in fur color, some are lighter. Just like, you know, we all have different hair colors. Well, animals have variation in their fur color as well. So in this population, let's say, there's some variation. Some light, some light colored mice, some darker colored mice. And let's say that a predator is affecting this population. There's a predator that preys on mice. So in this situation, what's going to happen, do you think? Bill? William? The birds are going to eat the um, like lighter mice because it's better? Probably the light colored mice are going to be preyed upon more frequently because they don't blend in as well. And so some of those light colored mice are going to be eaten. Which ones are going to survive longer? Okay. The dark ones. Obviously the darker ones. What? And therefore, if they can survive longer, if they're less likely to be eaten, they're also more likely to do what? Not only survive, to reproduce. <laughs> and when the darker mice reproduce, what are the, their offspring most likely going to be like? Probably also a similar fur color. And so if you sort of think about this population and carry that out for hundreds, thousands, millions of generations of mice, in a million generations, what do you think the population might look like? Bella? All dark mice. Probably all dark mice. Okay, if there's selective pressure that the dark mice is being darker is an advantage, well, over a period of time, that's going to become more common. And so we would say that this species of mouse has evolved over that period of time. It went from being a mix of light and dark colors to being mo all dark colored mice. So it has changed over time. It has evolved. This concept is called natural selection. Okay? Natural selection says that any organisms, any individuals that have good characteristics, beneficial traits, adaptations we call those, any living things that are well adapted to their environment will survive longer and therefore reproduce more. And what happens to any individuals that are not well adapted? Yeah, they don't survive. If you had some sort of mouse in the species that was born and happened to have fluorescent yellow fur for some reason, most likely not going to survive. It's going to be preyed upon very quickly. And therefore, that trait that is not an advantage is going to not continue in the population. This concept is called natural selection. Okay. So in natural selection, any individual that's well suited to its environment is able to survive, reproduce, and then pass on its traits to the next generation. An individual not well adapted will likely die out before reproducing. And therefore, harmful traits are not passed on to the offspring. And so over long periods of time, any characteristic that's beneficial, that's helpful to the species, becomes more and more common. 
any trait that is harmful or a disadvantage becomes less common over time, and that leads to evolution. And evolution is why we have such a great variety of life. So we kind of break natural suction into four steps, or four pieces. And the first one is really important. If you look around the room, obviously, are we all we are are we all one species? Yes, we're all humans. But is there variation among us? There's a ton of variation. Variations in all sorts of things. Okay, in height, in hair color, in eye color, um, in how our bodies work internally, things like that. And so there's variation in all species. Now we see it very easily when we're looking at other humans because we're humans and we notice these differences. But squirrels, for example, outside, is there variation among squirrels? Yeah, yeah we may not like pick up on all those variations, because they're another species, like you may say, my squirrels, they all are basically the same. But they're not. There's plenty of variety in you know, their fur color and the size of their tail and the size of their ears and things like that. There's a lot of variation in all species, but we're not in tune to it. And so that variation is an important part of natural selection. You have to start with variation. Variation means just that each individual is unique in their characteristics. So if you look at these animals, these um, grizzly bears, is there some variation there? What variation do you notice in these bears? Jackson? Their fur color. There are some differences in their fur color. Even though they're the same species, there's variation. How about in these um, ladybugs? Yeah, what is the variations that you most readily notice? Julia? Oh, um, their color. The color, how many spots there are, how large the spots are. Yeah, that's some variation. Okay. And now, in certain situations, some of the, maybe in some environments, having darker spots and larger spots is helpful. It's beneficial to the species. If so, what would happen to these ladybugs? Jeff? The yellow ones would probably die off. Yeah, that the ones that have the spots on them, that most match their environment, maybe they survive longer. They're less likely to be eaten by birds, and therefore, over time, the species might change, and more and more of the beetles might have that coloration pattern. So sometimes the variation is good, sometimes it's harmful, sometimes it's neutral. It doesn't help or hurt. So we start with variation, there's differences. And then we have this struggle for survival in nature. There is a constant struggle for survival. And that's due to many different factors. Sometimes there's just not enough food to support all of the organisms that um, are born. Other times there's not enough living space. Other times there are predators. Sometimes there's not enough water or nutrients or so forth. There's lots of different factors that limit population. You know, a single fish could lay hundreds of thousands of eggs at one time. Do they all become adult fish? Oh, no. no. Only a very small percentage do. What happens to those eggs? Yeah. How? Yeah. Some are eaten. What else? Some are born. Some are just not viable. Some might not be fertilized by the male. Okay. Once they do hatch, even if they're not eaten, some are eaten when they're young. Some may not be able to find enough food and starve to death. Only a small percentage make it into adulthood. Which ones do make it? The ones that have the best adaptations, the best traits, that happen to have whatever characteristics help those fish survive, those are the ones that survive. The best adapted, we say. Best adapted survive. And if they can survive, that always leads us to our next statement. If they survive, they can do what? Survive. Reproduce. Reproduce. Obviously, they have to survive into adulthood to reproduce. Okay. And when they do, what are their offspring like? They're like the parents, usually. They pass on these helpful traits 
actually very young. This is a frog reproducing. You haven't seen frog eggs? <clears throat> Big jelly-like mass of eggs. Again, they don't all reach adulthood, only a small percentage do. And so these successful individuals can reproduce, they can pass on their traits to offspring, and eventually, over a period of time, after many generations, this leads to changes in the whole population. It leads to evolution of the species. Any trait that's helpful becomes more and more common, until eventually the entire species has that trait, has that characteristic. And when we call, when that happens, we call those adaptations. So you know, this frog's coloration is an adaptation. It helps it blend in. Having webbed feet is an adaptation. It allows the frog to swim through the water efficiently. And those are traits that have evolved over a long period of time. You know, one of the one of the easiest um, examples we have is when we talk about predators. So if we think about the steps of natural selection we just talked about, think about this population of insects with this predator nearby. Um, what are the variations you see in these insects? Okay. The, size of color. the size of the insects varies. The color varies. Anything else? Down. The eye color. The eye color. Okay, those are some variations. What do you think the struggle for survival might be here? Um, um, the brown ones don't run into the leaf. Yeah, so the struggle to avoid being eaten, right? So which ones may be more successful? Maybe the smaller ones. Maybe being large one makes you more likely to be eaten. Or the green ones. And being brown makes you more likely to be eaten. So if the brown one is eaten, the larger ones are eaten, which ones are going to survive? The smaller green ones. And if they survive, they can reproduce. What are their offspring going to be like? Green. Small and green. And over time, this whole population may um, evolve to being green and small. But what if having red eyes gives these beetles better vision and allows them to avoid predation? What would we expect then? Yeah, the ones with red eyes would survive better and reproduce. And after many generations, all of the beetles would probably have the, that characteristic. So any beneficial trait helps the organism survive and becomes more and more common. So we often call this survival of the fittest. But what does fit mean? doesn't mean fit like, you know, physically fit like me. It means like a different type of fitness. Okay? Uh, in this case, survival of the fittest means uh, whichever organism is most <coughs> constantly change. Yeah. Is it, why don't we say survival of the strongest? Why wouldn't that be a good phrase for evolution, Evan? Sometimes it's, yeah. is it sometimes the strongest? Yeah. But not always. Sometimes it's beneficial to be small. Sometimes it's beneficial to be fast. Sometimes it's beneficial to be slow. Sometimes it's beneficial to be smart. Okay? So there's lots of different things that could be helpful. And so that's why we say survival of the fittest. Not strongest or fastest, but it depends on the individual situation. Okay? Whatever organism is most successful, that is the fittest. And that one will survive and have offspring. And the offspring will then resemble the parent.
And so that's one of the ways, so why are species different from each other? Well, there's two main sources of that variation. The first is what we just talked about, sexual reproduction. When species reproduce sexually, we have the combining of genes from two different parents. And that leads to variation. It shuffles the deck of the genes. And we end up with lots of different combinations. As you know, you're not identical to your brother or sister. You have, you're each unique from each other. Because you happen to get different genes from your parents. Even though you have the same parents, you've got different genes. Sexual reproduction leads to more variation in the species. But then there's another factor right, um, that leads to variation. Right? And these are changes that can happen as reproduction takes place. We call them mutations. And often people have the wrong idea about mutations because they've watched too many movies, read too many comic books. Having a mutation does not give something superpower. What exactly, it, what, does anyone know what a mutation really is? What does that mean if a mutation has happened? What? Like, I can give an example, like, say a frog lives in a creek nearby, like, a power plant, and like, or like a, nu a nuclear power plant, and like, the nuclear power plant goes off radioactive waves, and the frog can like, go around the head and like, go around the creek, lives and Okay. I'll get there in a minute. So you're right. So what's actually happening? Why would the frog have grow another limb or something like that? Well, well it's a change like in a species. In what? There's a change in something very specific. It's DNA. No. It's oh. DNA. It's DNA. A mutation is an accidental, unplanned change in the DNA of an organism. Kind of like a mistake happens. Now, Vlad was talking about there are certain chemicals, certain types of radiation that can increase the rate of mutations. And a mutation doesn't only lead to like growing a, something as extreme as growing a third leg or something. It can lead to very small changes. A mutation can lead to um, the color of something being darker. It can lead to a change in a protein within it. There's lots of different things that can happen as a result of a mutation. But these things happen all the time. Okay. When cells are reproducing, sometimes the DNA gets changed slightly. And that's what also can lead to variations. That a change in DNA can lead to some helpful trait or a harmful trait. I'm going to try to watch that later. So mostly the rest of our notes are all about some examples of evolution and natural selection. And so there's some neat ones to talk about. Because all species on Earth are, have evolved and have adapted to certain conditions. One interesting example are pea fowl. What's a pea fowl? Peacock. A peacock is a male pea fowl. A pea hen is a female pea fowl. So anyway, you've probably seen peacocks, right? You ever go to the Utica Zoo and they're kind of walking around? Yeah, they just walk around and I don't even look at them. Which ones do you see at the zoo mostly? Both. Oh, do you see both? Yeah. yeah. Oh, are there the females walking around? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. but I, you notice which one? Men. The male peacock, because they look cool. Blue. Why do they look like that? Right. Oh. So, so why? Hold on, hold on. So why do the male peacocks look so much different than the female pea hens? Karina? Um, they try to attract the females. Yeah. This is an example of something we call sexual selection. That in some species, traits are dictated by how one. One of the um, one of the genders, I guess you could say, one of the sexes choose who to mate with. In the pea fowl, the female chooses which males she will mate with, and she chooses the males based on their tail display. Male does. Um, so the more showy and colorful and larger the tail of the male the more likely a female will choose it as a mate. And therefore, it's more likely to what? Reproduce. Reproduce. When it passes on its genes, its male offspring, probably are going to have a large, showy tail. Okay? The more impressive the tail, the higher its chance of mating. And so, really, it's this selection of mates that have led to 
this characteristic in the males. Now, why then isn't don't male peacocks evolve to have a tail that's as high as this root? Um, Julia? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> Matt? Is it like parts of the female? What's that? They like have parts of the females. Oh, okay. That's one idea. Is that they get some DNA from the female, Jack? Maybe because like if it has a tail that's super big, it will be able to hold like its own body weight. Alright, so if its tail is too big, maybe it's no longer an advantage. It might be an advantage to finding a mate, but it could be a disadvantage in terms of surviving. Maybe you can't get around as well. Maybe then you can't get enough food and so forth to survive. And so there's a limit. Because at a certain point having a large tail is actually a disadvantage, and then they would be less likely to survive. And so that's why you don't see an extreme there. Now, why are females selected to be just sort of boring in color, brown, and just sort of blah? They don't have big showy feathers. This is often the case in lots of species. Jackson? I don't know if this is true, but so can I tell the difference? Not so much to tell the difference. So they why, yes, why? Why is like a boring colored female more likely to survive? Evan? Uh, because she's the one choosing who to mate with. So okay. She doesn't have to be so showy. So there's no advantage for her having showy feathers. And also... Um, she can like blend in when the peacock's just like really bright and you can see it. Yeah, that the females are more camouflaged to blend in. They care for um, the chicks after they hatch. They have to incubate the eggs after they're laid. So it's more beneficial to be um, sort of a, just a brown color to blend in. If you know, if you know male or ducks? Yeah, yeah they have green heads. Which have the green heads? Yeah, to attract things. What do the females look like? They're regular. Just kind of brownish in color for the same reasons, yeah. Yeah, so that's one example of natural selection. So just to summarize, in natural selection, any variety any variation that's helpful, that is selected for, will become more abundant over time, more common. Any variation that's harmful, that is selected against, will become less common, will become rare. You know, the ones that survive are the ones that are best adapted. Hey, is this a video? No, this is just a little, I don't know. We can watch it. It's just a, a five second video. It's 38 seconds. So, yeah, I'm here. There's a little demonstration of. Um, Look how low that's. Is that an elephant? No, just a thing. Yeah. Mr. So Arcuri and Mr. Richards here. So much. <laughs> We're trying to make friends with them. <laughs> so, if you try to bring the conversation. Yeah, and then they just bounce away. That's not, well, not very nice. Who are those two? Oh, and then the heart comes But out. it's okay. Don't feel too bad for for me there. Could so. I eat him? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Mr. Archery. Sorry, Mr. Richards. <coughs> you couldn't make friends. Uh, that was like the most depressing show. I I made a 70 after Mr. Richards and Director excluded me from our conversation at lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, all right. Okay, that, that shows more karma than natural selection. Maybe. So, um, as we know, Charles Darwin, we think of as kind of the father of, of evolution who gave us our views about natural selection. Well, Charles Darwin started to think about evolution um, on a journey that he took. So Charles Darwin became the ship's naturalist. Sort of a, just a general scientist on a ship called the HMS Beagle. And this ship sailed around the world, it took years, visiting all different continents and areas, bounced around the coast of South America, um, went through uh, Southeast Asia, eventually back to England. And along the way, Darwin, carefully studied, collected fossils, observed plants and animals in all these different places. One of the places that Darwin went were the Galapagos Islands. 
They're just off the coast of South America, off the western coast of South America. And they're a series of small little islands. Um, and what Darwin noticed when he visited all these islands, there were these birds, these finches. And there were different finch species that lived on each island. And he noticed they all basically had the same body. But when he looked at their beaks, their bills, he found that they were all different from each other. And they all were well suited to eating the food source that was available on each of the islands. Because the islands were all slightly different. Some had nuts for food, some had animals for food, some had cactus and so forth. So there are different types of food. Okay? And so Darwin's hypothesis that all of these different types of finches actually evolved from one common ancestor that migrated to these islands. And then on those islands, each finch kind of took a different evolutionary path because there were different conditions. Okay? This was an example of natural selection that Darwin cited as he was putting together his ideas about evolution. Some finches had evolved a beak that was useful for eating fruit and had a sharp beak underneath that. On the islands where there was a lot of nuts available, seeds, some finches that ate large seeds evolved a very thick beak for cracking those um, nuts open and getting at the seed inside. Others that ate smaller seeds evolved to have a smaller beak. Some ate insects, some ate larger insects, some even ate cactus. But what Darwin noticed was that each of these beaks was well suited to the food source available on the, on the island that finch was on. And so this was a good example of a bunch of birds that had a common ancestor, but once they moved to these different islands, started to take these different evolutionary paths and led to the development of all these different finch species. A great example of evolution is in bacteria or pests, insects. Has anyone had strep throat this year? This year? Okay. So if you have, how many people have had strep throat ever? Not fun, right? You get a sore throat. You go to the doctor. So when you have a sore throat, it's, it's not going away after several days. You go to the doctor. It's like that huge Q-tip down your throat, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And then they culture it. And they, they tell if you have strep throat. What causes strep throat? A bacteria. Streptococcus bacteria is the name of the actual bacteria. Strep throat. Okay. And so what do they give you to help you get better? An antibiotic. An antibiotic is a medication that kills bacteria. And so they give you your prescription for your antibiotic. They give you the pink amoxicillin that tastes like bubble gum. Yeah. Yeah. So you take it for two days, three days, and your throat starts to feel better. It doesn't hurt anymore. So are you supposed to just stop taking it? No. No. What do they say that you have to do? Um, it's like a time. Yeah. Yeah, usually 10 days for moxicillin. And they say continue to take it even if you feel better. And the reason they tell you that is because of evolution. Because if you think about it, you start taking your moxicillin on day one and day two. Gets into your bloodstream. Goes to the, your throat. In your throat, there's a colony of these strep bacteria causing inflammation, causing it to be swollen and painful. Well, after a few days, what does the amoxicillin do to some of those bacteria? It kills them. Which ones do you think die die off first? The Which ones? The, smaller the weaker ones. The ones that are not resistant to that bacteria at all. So you take it for two or three days. And most of the bacteria, most of those strep bacteria have died off. And your throat starts to feel better. But they may not all have died. And likely not all of them have died. Which ones are still holding on? The strongest ones, the ones that are most resistant, most able to tolerate this chemical that usually is deadly to the bacteria. And so if you stop taking it, what happens to those remaining stronger ones that are still in your throat? 
pattern? They start to they're still alive. They start to reproduce. And what are their offspring going to be like? The stronger, more resistant ones. And so five or six days later, what starts to happen? Your throat starts hurting again. But this time, it's a stronger infection. If you start taking your amoxicillin, you go back to the doctor, well, now the amoxicillin might not work because that population now in your throat is more resistant to it. So they may have to switch you to a different antibiotic. And there are even some types of bacteria which have evolved to be resistant to almost every antibiotic that we have. And those are very dangerous infections because there's no antibiotics that can control them. And so that's why the reason they tell you to take all of your prescription is for that reason. It's to prevent these bacteria from becoming resistant. And the same can happen with insects if you spray pesticides. Some are more resistant. Okay, if you don't spray long enough, then they just come back and they're stronger. Camouflage is very commonly used as an example of natural selection. And there's some really cool examples of camouflage organisms. Okay, and camouflage organisms have evolved usually because being camouflaged allows you to avoid predators or allows you to sneak up and eat more prey. This is a flounder. It's a fish that lives in the bottom of the ocean. It blends in perfectly with the bottom. These are ibixes. These live in the uh, Middle East in dry desert areas. They are small deer. You could see one here. You could see a small one here. No, they're big. But this is just taken from a way a long way up. These are big boulders. Here. So yeah, they blend in very well. These are pepper and moss. Our activity tomorrow is going to be focused on pepper and moss, so we'll talk more about them tomorrow. This is a catadid. This is the insect. It looks, its body looks exactly like a leaf. This is not a leaf, that's the insect's body. Even like a cat. I see it. People always say they see it, but hardly anyone ever really does. Wait a second. Who, who knows they see it? Jackson, where is it? I think. Where? Up, down? Up to right? Yeah, that. Where? Like, to the left. More. No. The right. You're lying. No. Oh, there it is. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I never knew that. I still can't. Yeah, I know. All right, we'll talk more about pepper and moss tomorrow, but. Pepper moss had two varieties, a light and a dark moss. Okay, the dark one stands out against lichen. You can see the lighter one here. Okay. What? Oh, I see the. We'll talk more about mimicry, I guess. Next week. What? Tomorrow we are going to be in the computer lab that's in the eighth grade hall. No, we're going to go directly there. What's that? What?